Hello and welcome to Epicent of Bitcoin episode 30. Today is July 27th and my name is Brian Fabian Crane. So today's a bit of an unusual episode because Sebastian is on vacation. So he's down somewhere in Albania at a wedding and today's show is going to be without him. The other thing that's a bit unusual is that we have just one guest today. So I actually went back before uh, through our back catalog of old episodes. And the last time we had one guest on, just one guest on was on episode 18. Otherwise, we've always been uh, more people than that. So I think it will be a bit more quiet and with a bit more time perhaps to go, you know, in depth on some topics. So the guest today with me is Rodko Albrecht. You know, I know Rodko, uh, you know, pretty well because uh, he lives in Berlin as well. He's a you know, Bitcoin entrepreneur here and he's very active in the um, Bitcoin community here. So he's the, uh, the business he started is called Bitbond. It's a Bitcoin based peer-to-peer lending platform. And we're going to have lots of time to kind of dive into that today. And it's, it's actually been around for quite a while. So it's sort of in, in Bitcoin terms, maybe old. <laughs> and uh, it's a really interesting use case for cryptocurrency. And he's also a board member of the Bundesverband Bitcoin, uh, which has become now the, the kind of German affiliate of the Bitcoin Foundation. So how are you doing today, Rodko? Yeah, hello. Thank you very much for having me. I'm doing well and I'm looking forward uh, to this nice uh, interview and uh, to your next episode of Epicenter Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to have you. I mean, I've been kind of wanting to have you on for for a while and so I'm I'm glad you're joining us today and looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, thank you. So perhaps let's get started with Bitbond. Um, Can you tell us like how, how did you originally get started with that? How did you have the idea? So I have been um, dealing with uh, financial services for quite a while, even before um, I uh, I was aware of Bitcoin. Um, I was uh, working in banking for Deutsche Bank in London in sales and trading. And after that, I worked as a management consultant and um, uh, did quite a lot of um, projects with financial services providers, especially banks. And during that time already, I was um, thinking about a startup idea uh, in the field of financial services. And that was also the time when I became aware of Bitcoin. And um, when I saw that, I thought that Bitcoin is a perfect tool to create a global peer-to-peer lending marketplace. Because so far, all peer-to-peer lending platforms that exist, and there are quite a significant number out there already, are purely national. So if you take Lending Club, for example, which is the largest peer-to-peer lending platform that exists today, um, it's purely based in the United States. Then you've got other platforms like Funding Circle, for example, uh, which is purely based in the UK. Both of these and many others are very successful and um, have proven that the concept of peer-to-peer lending works very good and has a lot of advantages compared to bank lending. But um, the only disadvantage it has is that when you do it in purely one market, um, it is quite difficult to get it started uh, because uh, the number of potential customers that you might have is somewhat limited to to that country. And the UK and the United States are quite large countries where this problem is not really significant. But if you look at smaller markets uh, and maybe markets even where not nearly everybody has a bank account, this becomes a little more difficult. And that's um, where Bitcoin actually came in and where I thought that uh, we could give it a kind of innovative approach and and try to uh, catch the advantages that peer-to-peer lending has and add to that the advantages that Bitcoin has. Yeah, that sounds like uh, it makes a lot of sense. Were, were you, was kind of, when you heard of Bitcoin, you thought like, oh, uh, this would work great for peer-to-peer lending or is peer-to-peer lending something you were thinking about before Bitcoin? I was thinking about peer-to-peer lending before Bitcoin uh, and I was already thinking back then about internationalizing peer-to-peer lending, but I didn't really see how to uh, how to do this in an, I would say, economic way or in a way so it makes sense for Uh, both the borrower, the lender, and also the platform that actually runs this business. 
Um, because if, if you wanted to do a international peer-to-peer -peer lending platform based on US dollars, for example, um, the costs of money transfers would be simply too high um, uh, so that loans would make sense because either interest rates for the borrower would have to be too high or the the returns that the lenders get would be simply too low so that it wouldn't be an attractive um, an attractive product and uh, the other thing that is a disadvantage if you did a international peer-to-peer -peer lending platform based on US dollars is that it will also take too long imagine you want to transfer money um, from the United States to a European country it takes a couple of days and that's simply too long in order to make an attractive lending product. So these are two very important factors where um, the fiat currency world does not really make a international peer-to-peer -peer lending platform workable. And then the other aspect is when you want to go into emerging markets uh, where typically only 20 to 30 percent of the population have bank accounts, uh, this also becomes a problem because if people don't have a bank account, they cannot participate in peer-to-peer -peer lending. And this is also another aspect where Bitcoin comes in and where Bitcoin brings big advantages. I wasn't even uh, aware that, you know, there are zero peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms um, uh, like international peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, but of course it makes total sense, right? I mean, if you if you charge twelve percent a year or something like that in interest, and then you have to pay, uh, I don't know, seven percent or eight percent in transaction fees, and I guess the issue becomes even more complicated when you have uh, repayments, right? When you have uh, people pay back maybe every month something to the lenders. I mean, that, that just creates so many transactions that it would be completely impossible now. Exactly. And what you also have is that if you have one loan, for example, typically this loan is uh, funded by more than just one lender. Because typically a lender that wants to invest a certain amount of money distributes his investments over over many many loans so typically one loan has i don't know maybe 10 or 20 lenders so it's exactly like you just said it um when you disperse the the repayment you disperse it actually to many different parties to so have very many very small transactions and that's exactly the point where simply it isn't economical to do it in a fiat world cool so uh, when did you get started? It was uh, about a year ago, or a bit more. Is that right? That's correct. So um, Bitbond went live in July 2013. And of course, we've been working on it uh, a couple of months uh, before that um, in order to code the platform, to, to design the processes on the platform. And um, this took us about uh, four months, roughly. And then we went live in July. And uh, how is the uh, how is the development been? So at the beginning, it was quite difficult um, because peer to peer lending is a marketplace, and uh, so you obviously need to balance supply and demand. And at the beginning, um, when uh, for example you uh, have only one or two projects where a borrower wants to borrow um, something, it's not very attractive for the lender um, because there is not much choice of different projects. And um, also the same applies to the borrower when the borrower knows that it's a new platform and um, there aren't many lenders, it's also not very attractive. So getting a marketplace started is, is pretty difficult because uh, you need to create market liquidity. And um, after we went through this first phase of, I would say, three to four months where it was very tough to get it started and where only very few projects got funded, um, it improved. And especially in the last three months, I would say, um, I'm very happy with the development where each month over 30 loans got funded and this figure is growing. So at the current level, I'm, I'm happy with the way how it develops. But at the beginning, it was quite tough to, to get it to a, um, I would say, to a certain traction. So uh, what worked best in kind of creating that initial marketplace? Because I think that's a problem so many uh, startups have. You no, know? like basically everyone with that model. Was there something you tried out that worked really well? 
Um, so, <laughs> to be honest, we didn't have a particular strategy about this. Um, what we did was uh, we were posting in, in many forums like Bitcoin Talk to to make at least the Bitcoin community aware of Bitcoin. And then with a couple of first very small projects, um, especially projects where people wanted to borrow Bitcoins in order to fund uh, the purchase of mining hardware, which also as of today is one of the most important use cases uh, for the borrower to buy mining hardware or to buy mining contracts. And um, that's how it got started. And after the first projects got funded, um, we were quite lucky to have uh, a few lenders that um, that became more active and um, that stayed with us. So we we had a pretty good um, uh, customer retention on the lender side, which is very important because then you sort of build up a customer base and don't have to acquire new customers on the lender side for every project. And then it became a little easier over time. Uh, but it, it was critical to get these first, I would say, 10, 15 projects funded. And uh, that was quite some work in order, to, in order to raise awareness for the platform. And after we had done that and um, we were successful in, in search engine optimization, which is also quite important. So you can find us under uh, our most relevant keywords like Bitcoin loan or Bitcoin lending. And then we also had more traffic on our site. And um, that's when things became a little easier and when things got started. Yeah, I remember because I, I was, uh, I think, among or in the very early days of Bitbond, I, I also uh, lent some money through the platform. And I think there was like two projects at a time. And, you know, I checked again uh, today and there was, I think, 38 projects listed. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's great to see that grow. Yeah, it's um, absolutely. And it, I mean, it's still a level uh, when you compare it to other more mature peer to peer lending platforms where we certainly have still a lot of room for improvement and a lot of room for growth. And obviously, we want to grow further. And also, the product becomes more attractive the more market liquidity you have. But I think that it's fair to say that we have um, sort of reached a certain threshold where it, it is attractive enough that when you post an interesting project and uh, you are a credit worthy borrower that your probability to get funded is sufficiently high cool um well let's talk perhaps a bit about how this exactly works so i guess as a lender right i create an account i basically uh, put my bitcoins in what is a web wallet and then i uh i give money to or i can kind of give money to different or lend money to different uh, loans it, that's how it works no that's correct that's correct so you sign up and that's um a fairly easy thing um you have to confirm your email address after you signed up and at that very moment you have a web wallet with bitbond um that uh, you can also use for other things as your web wallet if you like and um, once you have funded uh, your web wallet with Bitbond then you can use these funds to um, to contribute to loan projects and your minimum uh, your minimum lending amount per loan is 0 0.01 Bitcoin so it's a fairly small amount which means that when you um, want to invest one Bitcoin, for example, you can distribute this theoretically over 100 projects. And um, that is, this is something that's very attractive um, to somebody who wants to get started with a smaller amount um, that you can diversify your holding. And this is something that's um, uh, in investment terms uh, uh, an attractive feature because um, typically in the investment world, you want to have a certain diversification in your portfolio. And that's exactly what you can create here as a lender. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one thing that just came to mind before um, that I, I think could be an interesting product for the future was because right right now, I guess you'd have to sort of manually go through, uh, you know, all the projects and sort of bid a certain amount for that. But it would be cool if, you know, you sort of offered like a, what do you call it, like a collateralized or a sort of a collected loan that takes shares of all the projects and, you know, you can just do that and then you automatically invest in the different projects. 
Right, that's uh, something that's definitely possible and uh, that uh, we can see at other more mature peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. The first thing that we would like to get started with um, in the future would be something that we call a bidding agent, which means that you would define um, a certain risk and return profile that fits your preferences. And then this bidding agent places bids on projects that creates a portfolio that matches your desired uh, risk and return profile. And this is something what we would like to get started with um, that would make it a little easier for the lender to constantly um, invest and also reinvest uh, the repayments that you get as a lender and to to make it a little more convenient for the lender. Yeah, that sounds like a great thing that, you know, would essentially accomplish something uh, really similar. Now, is it a similar model, like, for example, Kickstarter, where you have to reach a certain threshold for the loan to actually be paid out? Or, you know, if, if somebody wants to raise one Bitcoin and they only raise only uh, maybe half of the loan, uh, you know, you can find lenders for, does it still take place? So, yes, there is a threshold. And this threshold is at 30%. So when you want to borrow one Bitcoin, for instance, and uh, you have 0.3 Bitcoins or more funded, then this project actually gets started. However, the borrower at any point in time during the listing period, which we call an auction, uh, can cancel this auction. So the borrower can decide until the very last minute whether uh, he or she is, is happy with the funding status of the project and can cancel it. Um, but typically, um, when over 30% are funded, the project does get started. So uh, the borrower can cancel it uh, even if it's fully funded before the, the auction time is up? The borrower can cancel it before it is funded. At the moment where um, the the um, the project is fully funded, the borrower cannot cancel it anymore. Um, so only if the auction is still going on and the auction period is 14 days, um, during that time the borrower can cancel it. But if, for example, the project gets fully funded after five days, then the borrower cannot cancel it anymore. Then it simply gets started. Cool. Well, I want to talk briefly about one thing that I've noticed a lot on your platform, which I think is pretty interesting. I'm, I'm curious if that's something you sort of you know, knew was going to happen in the beginning, which you see a lot of small loans uh, that people want to take out and they kind of say, oh, you know, this is a you know six week loan, a pretty high interest rate, but a small amount. And it's like, oh, I'm going to pay this back really quickly. And this is just to build, you know, my reputation on the system. Because if I want to take out a bigger loan down the line, you know, if people see, oh, there's been five projects and I paid them all back in full and on time, you know, that's going to help me get a much better interest rate. Is that something you, you know, expected to happen? Do you see that on other um, lending platforms as well? Um, on, on most more mature lending platforms, we do not see this, um, but we see it on other Bitcoin based peer to peer lending platforms, uh, where the, these reputation loans also exist. Um, uh, so it, it was not exactly a surprise, but we didn't expect it, um, to, um, to happen to this extent. And, uh, my personal, uh, my personal view on this is that, um, when we as a platform improve the, the rating that we give to borrowers, um, that these reputation loans at some point will not be necessary anymore. Um, so that the lender, uh, the, sorry, the borrower can ask directly for the amount, amount um, they actually want to borrow right away without having to take out one or two reputation loans. So this is where we actually want it to go because then the process will also be faster for the borrower. But right now it's, it's a phenomenon that exists not only on Bitbond, but also on other platforms. And that um, is, I would say, normal because people uh, want to show that they are uh, credit worthy and that they can actually repay their loans. I mean, it actually makes a lot of sense to me. So I'm curious, why do you think that's 
uh, specific to um, Bitcoin platforms and you just don't see that on, I don't know, Lending Club or other sites? I, I think one of the reasons is that the minimum loan amount that we have is pretty small. Um, in, in the case of Bitbond, it's 0.1 Bitcoin. So that's actually a pretty small loan amount. And uh, also, of course, this also depends which country you're coming from, because it makes a difference whether uh, you take a loan of 0.1 Bitcoin in Kenya or in France, uh, obviously, because the purchasing power of this amount of Bitcoin is different in these two countries. Um, but uh, generally, it is possible on Bitcoin-based peer-to-peer lending platforms to take out these smaller loans, while the minimum loan amount on Lending Club, for example, I think is two or three thousand dollars. So that's a significantly higher loan amount, which means that when you wanted to take out a reputation loan through this platform, um, it would cost you much more money because the amount of interest, obviously, that you need to pay on two or three thousand dollars is higher than uh, on a smaller loan. Oh, that, that's very interesting. So is one of the reasons why you see these much bigger amounts on Lending Club also because they have uh, higher costs for payment? Yes, I'm sure that this is one reason. Um, because when you run a, I would say, traditional peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, what you have to do is you, you need to uh, cooperate with a bank that actually conducts all the payment transactions for you. So you as a platform, you do the administration of the loans, but the actual payments that run in the background are conducted by a bank. And that's normal because um, typically when you start a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, you don't want to build your own bank on top of which you do the payment transactions. So you need to purchase these services and um, they are quite expensive. So running a traditional peer-to-peer -peer lending platform uh, creates a significant costs on, <clears throat> on your infrastructure side, which in the Bitcoin world are much, much less. Okay, yeah, no, no, that makes total sense. So let's talk about one thing that I've sort of thought a lot about in the context of uh, Bitcoin lending and that I think is, uh, is an interesting and, and very tricky topic. And that's, of course, you know, the, the issue of uh, the exchange rate and deflation. So I, I just kind of want to briefly explain why I think that can be an issue. So, for example, when I went on the site today, I saw that uh, one of the projects was some guy in Iowa who wanted to take out a loan uh, of 2.2 Bitcoins to put some solar panels on his house. So, you know, it seems like a, a great project, etc. You know, he has uh, $3,400 in monthly income. And uh, the terms would be a repayment at sort of 11.6% interest rate per year and over three years. Mm -hmm. Now, the, um, the tricky thing I think here is, right? So let's just assume that Bitcoin is going to be a huge, you know, that sort of lifts up to its potential. It's going to be the success we expect it to be. Now, then we may see that in two years down the line, perhaps the exchange rate could be ten thousand dollars per bitcoin or something like that now of course if he's paid back uh, half of it then you know maybe he has like one one bitcoin outstanding but that bitcoin then could be worth you know ten thousand dollars um which is a much higher amount in dollar terms that you know he borrowed today so i i think that's sort of something that you know is not unlikely to happen and then if it happens, it happens sort of across the board. And maybe sometimes people are aware of that, right? Sometimes some people taking out loans will probably think like, oh, I know that risk and it's something that, you know, I'm sort of happy to take. Let's say I think that would, for example, make sense if let's say you work in the Bitcoin space and you know that if the Bitcoin price goes up a lot, okay, I have to pay back a bigger loan amount. But then also, you know, my career is going to be doing super well and I'm going to be okay with that. Um, so it could function as a type of hedge. But, um, but I suspect for most people that's not the case. And I, I'm sort of worried that perhaps a lot of people aren't quite aware of the risk they are taking when they take out these loans in Bitcoin. Especially longer term loans, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. it's six weeks, okay. But three years, that's a very long time. 
That's right. Um, so three years is a long time, and there certainly is a exchange rate risk, uh, which which applies uh, mainly for the borrower that um, has this risk, especially in that case where the borrower converts the loan to a local currency and then has a income stream in a local currency, but then needs to repay Bitcoin. So um, our opinion is that the exchange rate will probably not go that high, but obviously nobody can prove this. Um, and in order to mitigate the exchange rate risk, we want to implement something that's called a exchange rate pegged loan uh, uh, within the next months. And what this means is that when you take out a loan uh, and the loan is one Bitcoin, for example, uh, then you take out this loan because you probably want to convert it to local currency. And that's exactly the amount of purchasing power that you actually want to borrow. And um, what, what we will do is that the repayments uh, are linked to the exchange rate. So when the exchange rate goes up, you actually have to repay a smaller amount of Bitcoins um, because we will look at the payment streams and what they are actually worth in dollars or in euros, for example. So actually we have a constant value um, expressed in a fiat currency, um, but the payment is still done in Bitcoin, but will uh, fluctuate along with the exchange rate. And this is a product that, um, that will be attractive to those who, who are not hedged in some way or the other against exchange rate fluctuations. And um, uh, I think this will significantly help to mitigate the problem of exchange rate fluctuations. Also, this, um, this, this might sound uh, as an unusual thing for people who live in Europe or Northern America, but this is something which we actually see in countries where you have very high inflation rates. So in Mexico, for example, if you take out a loan in, in Mexican pesos, this loan is typically also linked to the US dollar exchange rate. So if you go to a local bank in, in Mexico and you take out this loan, they will peg it to the US dollar exchange rate because the inflation is so high that um, you have a problem from the banking side that when you get the repayments after one or two years of the loan, that they are worth much less compared to the point in time when the loan was uh, paid out. So this is a model that we see in other countries um, where you often have the reverse problem that you have a high inflation and that we can also apply to Bitcoin loans. Yeah, I think this makes a absolute ton of sense. I remember you gave a talk at uh, the Bitcoin meetup here in Berlin that I started uh, last year. That was even, and uh, that's one of the things. Was like you should do this because it it just makes so much sense. Now I'm curious: does this apply to both sides? So uh, does that mean as a as a lender, I also get back the um, the kind of uh, dollar? equivalent of uh, my loan or do you have someone else who steps in and kind of takes that exchange rate risk no so both sides the borrower and the lender uh, make a conscious decision for this type of product so you will have as a borrower the option to select which type of loan you would like to have pure bitcoin loan or a bitcoin loan that's packed to the exchange rate and then the lender also will see on the listing whether it's a pure loan or a pegged loan and they will have to decide because if you lend out in the in the pegged loan then it makes sense also to convert the payment streams instantaneously into your local currency um, so both sides will have to make a conscious decision which type of product they actually want okay okay so essentially as a lender that sort of means like you're gonna sell I mean, you can think of it as in like, I'm going to sell my one Bitcoin now, I'm going to lend it out and I'm going to sort of get, you know, the US dollar equivalent plus interest at future uh, points in time, although paid in Bitcoin. Exactly. So it's, uh, exactly. yeah, that's interesting. I, I think another way to do this, I don't know if you've looked into that, but that could be really interesting 
is if, you know, let's say I lent a Bitcoin and I want to get back Bitcoin, but the borrower wants to pay back sort of the dollar equivalent, you know, maybe there would be a way to uh, create, to basically uh, hedge that on a derivative exchange so that, you know, I, I can get my Bitcoins in Bitcoin terms back and uh, the other guy can pay back in dollars and perhaps one could buy um, a derivative uh, on an exchange. Is that something you also looked into? Um, yes, I have been thinking about this. Um, it is theoretically possible. Um, it has got two problems. At the moment, um, there are some Bitcoin derivatives, but the markets are not very liquid. Um, that's one thing, That, but hopefully will be solved in the future. Um, the other issue you have is that um, this hedge costs uh, you money, obviously, because it's a sort of buying insurance. And um, it you, you would have to look at it uh, in a very detailed way, what's actually um, more cost effective, buying this insurance, so buying a derivative contract that hedges you against exchange rate fluctuations, or do it over the packed loan, which actually is also a, a certain type of hedge, where um, the costs might be smaller because the cost that you have is your um, cost to convert Bitcoin to local currency. So you typically have an exchange fee that you need to pay when you when you go to an exchange or um, uh, or or a marketplace where you can buy and sell Bitcoins. And my view on this is that at the current state, um, exchanging. Bitcoins constantly into local currency is cheaper than actually buying a hedge. This might change in the future. Uh, this might change in the future because once we have maybe uh, more liquid derivatives markets, uh, it might become more attractive to actually buy the insurance directly on a derivatives exchange. But as of today, um, it, it wouldn't be very cost effective. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And I, I also think this is maybe something down the line, right? Because at the moment, I guess the derivatives exchanges are sort of like totally nascent and right. not liquid. So, uh, but uh, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. And I especially think the the, um, the US dollar pegged loans are interesting. That may even then become interesting for people, let's say, who are not Bitcoin holders. But uh, let's say I'm in the US, I just want to invest some money and I'm like, Oh, you know, here is a way I can start giving out peer-to-peer um, -peer loans, sort of globally, and you know, perhaps I would take some dollars, buy bitcoins, then lend them out, and I get back the you know dollar equivalent plus interest in the future. I I don't know how uh, your returns would compare to Lending Club, or if this is something that will make sense, but uh, perhaps that would be an option as well. Um. I absolutely agree um, because this is a product where you want to have, uh, where you have uh, want to have a kind of foreseeable stream of repayments. Uh, that's why actually investments into loans are also called fixed income investments. So you have to make a decision whether you actually want to uh, invest in Bitcoin as an asset and believe in a future price increase of Bitcoin itself or whether you want to have a more constant and a more foreseeable return, which is in the range of 10% per year and uh, not care too much about exchange rate fluctuations. So it's an investment decision that you need to take in the first place. Do I want to invest in an asset that's Bitcoin or do I want to invest in a fixed income asset that happens to be paid out in Bitcoin, but where I do not actually care about the underlying uh, payment network. I'm just looking at my at my fixed income returns. That's the decision that you need to make as a lender and as an investor. Cool. That's that's uh, no. I think that that makes a lot of sense. It's very interesting. Now, um, very briefly, can you talk a little bit about how Bitbond compares to uh, other Bitcoin lending platforms? I know a BTC Jam is one that I, I'm aware of. Uh, I I suspect I think there may be others. Um, so uh, how how do you compare those? So um, the 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 pure concept is is quite similar, I have to say, uh, but we have one um, 
factor where where we want to differentiate ourselves and this is um the point where we actually do a credit assessment of the borrower which is um which is mandatory on bitbond so when a borrower signs up on bitbond we check the credit worthiness and uh, we do it manually so each borrower gets verified manually before uh, he or she can post loan projects on our platform and um, this is something which we also uh, seek to improve significantly over time and where we where we want to um, make a claim that uh, we as a platform doing this credit assessment so well that we can say with a certain probability what your returns in a diversified loan portfolio are going to be the other peer to peer bitcoin lending platforms that exist also do a credit assessment but um they don't uh, link the interest rate that the borrower needs to pay to this credit assessment so with bitbond when the borrower gets an a rating for example um he cannot choose the interest rate that he wants to pay but we determine this interest rate based on the rating and we do this because we want to um deliver foreseeable returns on a loan portfolio at bitbond whereas at the other platforms the borrowers can choose the interest rate themselves and that's our main differentiating factor compared to the other platforms okay no that that's very interesting cool now let's talk a little bit about the topic that i i know you've also looked into and uh, you know i think it's a, a very important topic it's kind of been you know in the news a lot which is a uh, the topic of regulation now um perhaps let's get started with the bit license thing you know i mean i'm sure you've uh, read about it as well i know that you know, you you probably have to get a bit license as well, strictly speaking, no? Unless you exclude New York lenders and borrowers. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Are you um, are you thinking about this? Are you thinking of exclude trying to exclude New Yorkers, or are you, do you think you're just gonna go ahead and sort of ignore it? So, um, as far as I know, the bit license is not effective yet. That's yeah, it's true. Uh, it may change, of course. So it's, uh, it's and of course, obviously, this may change. So should it become effective as it is um, as it is drafted now, um, we actually really might exclude New York um, New York users uh, because I think at the current state. Uh, it's not realistic for us to obtain a bit license. Um, so probably it, it would be the only way to, to make this work right now. Um, maybe in the future, uh, we would then try to get a bit license, um, depending on how, how difficult and, and how lengthy the process actually is. But uh, at the current state, it probably wouldn't be realistic for us to obtain a bit license. Yeah, I totally agree. Also unattractive, just if you look at their terms, because they're uh, terrible. But um, are you currently doing KYC on lenders as well? No, currently we don't do KYC on lenders. Um, but also the, um, the amount of Bitcoins that you can lend is limited. And um, we plan to implement KYC for lenders that want to uh, that want to lend larger amounts than uh, than uh, ten bitcoins, and uh, we are probably going to implement this. Um, currently, we uh, we haven't done this because so far um, there aren't users that are interested to lend more. Uh, we have a large lender base that typically lends smaller amounts, but at some point we will probably implement this. Uh, is that something you are required by law to do that when it's above a certain amount or or are, are there other reasons why you're planning to do that? So there is two things. One is a requirement by law, which uh, today I, uh, um, 
I cannot actually say with uh, with certainty because we are in a communication with the German financial regulator BaFin, and um, once we have um, sort of um, uh, agreed with BaFin what is actually the regulatory framework that applies to Bitbond, we will know whether we are required to do KYC for the lender or not. So this is something that is in, in the process of, of, um, of being determined. Mm, but also at, at, at some point when you have a lender that wants to lend large amounts, it, um, it, it, it's very good to actually know with uh, with high certainty who this person actually is in case there are um, there are some some uh, differences on on, on, on certain uh, terms so when the lender is, is, is unhappy with with the service and um, and um, wants to post claims uh, it would be important for us to actually know who this person is when we talk of uh, larger amounts okay cool interesting and in i guess a sort of a general question has it also i, I know you heard in germany and sort of being regulated in germany have you thought if the you know regulatory climate may change here of uh, going offshore is that something that's sort of on the back of your mind um, we do not. We do not want to go offshore. Um, if the regulatory framework would be so demanding and so difficult for a startup that it's not realistic to operate under this regulatory framework, we would probably think about it. But currently, we do not want to go offshore, and we want to comply with the German um, regulations. Yeah, let's hope let's hope they turn out well. I know the the EBA thing. I think a lot of people sort of worried their uh, opinion. Although I guess it's uh, still a few years off to see what exactly comes out of that. Um, and and even that is a lot. It looks a lot better, I think, at least in many ways than the bit license stuff. So hopefully the yeah, I really hope that the regulators are going to make wise decisions and. Um, that they are going to balance the interests that they obviously have in in um, in regulating businesses and in in letting innovation happen. Uh, that's simply the the trade off that the regulators face, and I hope that they are going to make good decisions that that takes into account their requirements, which obviously do exist but that also take into account um, the, the reality of, of running uh, and starting Bitcoin-based businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's going to be a hugely important thing. And it's, I, you know, I, I'm, I personally think this is not going to, you know, it's not going to make or break Bitcoin, even if they have a horrific uh, regulation spot. It could, of course, have huge consequences in that, like, it makes it much harder to get funding. It could force businesses like you to go offshore. It, it could have a lot of negative impacts if, if they're really going to be that stringent. It could slow down uh, the progress of Bitcoin like uh, massively. So I absolutely, absolutely agree. Yeah. One more thing. I, I don't know if you thought about this. It, it's probably a bit off, but uh, one thing that I think is quite interesting if you look at uh, projects like, uh, especially Ethereum, uh, who are kind of trying to decentralize uh, a whole web infrastructure and a lot of different things. Uh, you know, some of the things they, they want to decentralize is have like reputation systems and then something, a service like, uh, like Bitbond would actually work, uh, quite well, I think, in a completely decentralized way. So are you, are you aware of anybody working on, for example, a, a totally decentralized P2P lending platform? Is it something that you've, um, kind of been thinking about how that would work or is it something that's not on your mind? So um, I am not aware as of today that somebody is working on a totally decentralized peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, but it's something that's at least in theory very attractive to me. And it's something that I hope 
we can be working on maybe in the next one or two years when we have implemented a lot of functionalities on our platform that we want to implement like these exchange rate pack loans for example that we talked about so once we have implemented um, a certain i would say basic set of features that we want to have the decentralization is something that um, i personally would very much like to work on i think it requires a much higher degree of automation compared to what we have today because a lot of processes are manual um, but this is just the starting setup i would say once we get to a point where we can automize i would say nearly all the processes that run on bitbond and that run in the background that the customer might not even see i think we can start moving to a at least more decentralized organization compared to what we have today oh that's interesting so you're actually thinking that this is a direction that you might want to take bitbond itself in in a, at some point in the future yes at least i want to give it a try because to be honest um before we have not tried it i'm not sure whether it will be possible to do it fully decentralized i think there might be some uh, processes that are difficult to decentralize but um i i i like the concept and i think before you won't try it you simply won't know and i think it is something that we at least uh, want to try and it also depends to which extent you can actually bring it um but i think that there is a a at least larger extent of decentralization possible compared to what we have today yeah absolutely i mean i think this is something today that would probably be not possible to do um but it may look quite different in a, a year from now i think you know once you start having a lot of these a service is in place that you can build on top of, you know, if you have a decentralized, you know, reputation systems, things like that, that you can kind of leverage. But I, I mean, I certainly agree. I think it may be challenging to fully decentralize it. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's interesting. And I, I think, I, I guess people are working on, on these kind of things and we'll, we'll see how well they work and what comes out of that. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm also very curious to see, um, uh, how uh, decentralized autonomous uh, organizations will evolve and uh, I'm very curious to see some some startups to give the setup a try and I hope that we will also be able to learn from them and I think somebody just needs to get it started with maybe a smaller project that is um, that doesn't involve so many different processes in the background and maybe we can take this as a starting point then and learn from it and also um, build more complex organizations based on this concept yeah absolutely so let's talk a little bit kind of to um, you know finish this off about uh, I know you gave a talk at the Inside Bitcoins conference on kind of financial services in general and what the effect may be on financial services or that Bitcoin will have on financial services. Um, can you briefly share uh, what your thoughts are on that topic? Yes, absolutely. So um, if, if you look at the current state of financial services, um, you, you have many aspects where things are the way they are because of legacy simply and um, one aspect that certainly plays a significant role here is the infrastructure the technological infrastructure that you need in order to run a bank or a insurance company or an asset management company and this is typically legacy infrastructure that um, is very heavy on hardware uh, that uh, is run on software that's uh, up to 30 years old and that's simply not been built in a world that um, assumes that everybody has an internet connection and that we have cloud computing and that we have Bitcoin. So these services today run with a infrastructure that um, at the time when it was built was uh, the best that they had 
but um, that we can vastly improve upon. And Bitcoin offers a great opportunity. And what I think is that once we have startups uh, in financial services that are built on a technology like Bitcoin, that uh, we will see many very interesting developments. And one thing is that market access to financial services uh, becomes much easier because the infrastructure that you need when you run based on Bitcoin is simply more cost effective and more programmable and much better suited for the internet compared to hardware that these companies run today. So once we have easier access to um, to these markets, I think that we are going to see more competition. And I personally am a big believer in competition because on the one hand, it might force um, the existing incumbents to improve on their services, to become more cost effective and to think about redesigning their infrastructure that they run. So that's one thing. The other thing is that um, that we will see more competition and therefore we will have more choice for the customer, which I also think is a great benefit. And the next thing that it might bring is that uh, the margins, the profit margins that the incumbents in, in financial services make will go down. So I think it will be a tougher world in the financial services sector. Because as of today, uh, many firms like banks, insurance companies, asset managers um, make very good margins. And uh, I think that this is going to change a little bit in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's kind of uh, one of the hopes we have now is that we will be able to build uh, an entirely a new financial system with Bitcoin and, and that, that could be a tremendous, a tremendous, I think not, not least in what you've mentioned, it's just uh, in terms of access, in terms of like kind of anyone can participate and there won't be these barriers. Exactly. Um, access is also a very uh, important aspect because uh, since since um, financial services run on this legacy and expensive infrastructure, they also need to have higher prices than they needed to have if they run on a more cost-effective platform. So when um, costs go down and prices go down for the consumer, um, it will also be um, the services will be more accessible, um, not just from uh, from the point that you might not. Uh, need a bank account but also because these services will be cheaper and more people will be able to afford them absolutely so you know i guess one so i'm kind of interested like what what parts of the financial um system do you think will be most affected by this and sort of first perhaps we should say first affected by this i don't know uh, payments is definitely one that a lot of people thinking about and, and there's so much activity in that space uh, you know you now work on lending uh, I know, of course, money transfer that there's that, which you know is kind of very related to payments. But uh, are there other areas that you think will be sort of um, ripe and the first to be affected by this? So um, I really believe that payments and and loans will, if we talk about financial services, will come first. And I think what's then also going to come almost hand in hand is personal financial management. So today we see a lot of startups that try to vastly improve actually the, the user interface of bank accounts. Because when you log into your typical online banking interface, um, what you see there is a very simple list of transactions that you have made over your bank account. And usually that's about it. And today we see a lot of startups that build apps that um, have very good and high quality graphical representation of what's going on in your bank account. And that also try to add different convenient functionalities on top of your bank account. And this is something where, where um, startups work on a lot and where they have a lot of good ideas, but where it is also quite difficult to implement it. If you look at Germany, for example, if you want to build an app based on German current accounts, um, not all 
banks run the same standard and the same API. So it, it's quite difficult to do this. It, it's possible, but it takes quite a significant amount of work in order to have one app that is um, that is compatible with different uh, banks. When we talk about the Bitcoin world, I think it will be much easier to create apps in the space of uh, personal financial management. And that's why I believe that at some point we will not have just simple wallets that um, allow you to send and receive Bitcoins, but that will allow you to do analysis based on your transactions that will be uh, that will add functionalities and that will add a large amount of convenience for the consumer. So that's why I think that this is a space where we might not see a lot today, but which will probably come one of the next fields uh, where we'll see a lot of innovation based on Bitcoin. That's super interesting. I've, I've never thought about this, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. I think that's definitely uh, will be very, very interesting because I, I think... I suspect what we might see emerging will be things that are just really, really different from bank accounts. Like we, we probably can't really uh, project today what that will look like and, you know, how people will think of money, how people will think of uh, payments, etc. And, and the accounts in that context. But I agree. I think that's definitely an area that we will probably, hopefully maybe we'll see some of those startups switch over to Bitcoin uh, once adoption is a bit higher. Yeah, right. And, and I think it's what, what you just said that we don't even know what we will see. I, I totally agree with that. And, um, but that's the great thing because Bitcoin as a technology has so much potential that you can build many different applications on top of it that I think we will see a lot of experiments. Not all of them might, might be attractive to the consumer, but, but some things might emerge that are possible based on Bitcoin that are simply not doable on top of regular bank accounts. And that's why I believe that we might see some very interesting things there that we might not even think of today. It's the same when the internet got started. Many people were not um, uh, were not aware uh, of the possibilities that it's going to create in the future. It's such a great platform. And I think the same applies to Bitcoin, that we are going to see very interesting things that we might not even be able to think of today. Yeah, absolutely. I think one one area I would kind of add to the, the list you've made is I think crowdfunding and sort of equity crowdfunding. I think that could be a big one, although there you're going to have big regulatory hurdles to uh, cross, I think, probably maybe bigger than any other area. Yes, uh, I agree. Probably you have you will have these hurdles and it's going to be interesting to see whether um, whether the the platforms that want to uh, enable equity-based crowdfunding in Bitcoin are going to comply with regulation, whether they are going to find a way together with regulators to to get it started, or whether they are going to do regulatory arbitrage and go offshore. I think this is going to be a very interesting development. And my personal hope is that um, they will find a way together with the regulators so they are not driven to go offshore so that they can comply but with a reasonable regulatory framework which takes into account both the regulatory realities that they need to um, that they need to cope with but also with the realities that startups face and um, that uh, will not uh, be in the way of innovation yeah I agree um, I, I mean I, I totally share your hope. I, my sort of suspicion is that I, I believe or I expect that the regulatory burden could be so high that it kind of destroys the purpose and that we may see more of an offshore thing. But of course, that's difficult because then as a company, if you're raising money, uh, you know, there is, there's no way to hide this really. You know, I think it's about personal loans and you go offshore. Uh, you know, you can't really prevent people from taking out personal loans. It doesn't really make sense for the government to try to start hunting down people who take out like a, a 2000 euro loan on a platform. Uh, plus, you may not actually have to reveal personal information if you have a, a reputation, right? So I think you'll be able to do this yeah. uh, offshore and then there's there will be very little regulators can do. But that's different when you talk about a company that's trying to raise like a million dollars or something, because you won't be able to hide that. Exactly. And, uh, so I think it, it will be more difficult to do this offshore. 
Um, but yeah, it's an interesting area. Totally I guess agree. sort of yeah. sort of tying into that, there was one one thing I uh, I forgot to mention, but I also want to cover very briefly is that I know you've been sort of in the process or you've been trying to raise a uh, financing round. And I know, for example, at the, the state of, at the Coin Summit, one of the talks was um, on the, the state of Bitcoin report from Coindesk. And one of the really striking numbers that sort of came out there was that in the, I think, quarter two or maybe it was 2014, I don't, I don't know the time frame, but the $200 million had been raised in, uh, in VC financing. And of those, just 5 million were in Europe. And basically almost the rest, almost all of the rest was in, in the US. So um, what has your experience been talking with uh, venture capitalists? How do you sort of, um, what, what do you use on, on the climate in Europe to uh, raise money for Bitcoin startups? So what, what I have seen when talking to venture capitalists is that they have an eye on Bitcoin and on Bitcoin startups, and um, they certainly think about it a lot. But so far, only a very small amount of VC funding went or came from European VCs. So they are in a waiting position, I would say. They are looking at a lot of startups, but so far they didn't become active. And what what could happen is that when one of the larger European-based VCs will do a bigger Bitcoin investment, a bigger deal with a startup, that this might um, sort of kick it off. Because I know that there is a lot of VCs looking at this field, but it hasn't made the decision yet to invest. And I think that once you have at least one or two of the more renowned and larger VCs doing a deal in Europe, then this might actually kick off uh, a wave, maybe not as big as we have seen in the US, but at least a, a wave where we will see more startups um, in the Bitcoin world getting funded. And um, I could imagine that maybe over the next one or two years, this this might also happen um, because we typically see that these cycles, these investment cycles um, where you have um, social, then you have mobile apps and uh, now it's Bitcoin that when it exists in the US, that after a certain amount of time, it also um, becomes a reality in Europe. And I think that this is a trajectory that will be quite similar for Bitcoin. So once we have seen one, two, maybe three larger deals that it will kick off a wave. Uh, what kind of level of understanding have you encountered in your conversations? Do you feel like they, they understand what Bitcoin is, how it works and what it potentially is, or they're still sort of trying to wrap their head around it? To be honest, it's, it's very mixed. Um, I've spoken to some people who, who looked at it in quite significant detail and that were very knowledgeable about Bitcoin. But I've also talked to people who, who looked at it and only grasped, I would say, the surface of Bitcoin, but didn't really learn about the whole concept and the whole potential behind it. And uh, it was interesting because in, in, in some conversations, I was able to, to also um, to, to deliver some more knowledge about Bitcoin. And then these people actually got more interested. So um, obviously, uh, they have very busy jobs and maybe not always take the time that's required, especially for a, I would say, more advanced technology like Bitcoin to look into it in, in more detail. But once, um, once and they give it the chance to talk about it with them uh, and uh, get a better understanding of it, they also um, become more interested because they feel that they better understand the potential that's behind it. So I would say it's mixed and I hope that it's going to improve because I am personally convinced that once the knowledge that um, also venture capitalists have about Bitcoin, um, the amount of investments that is going to take place in this space is going to increase. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a hope I share as well. And uh, I hope that's a development that we'll see in the next year. So I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's something uh, we will see. So um, Rodka, thanks so much for, for joining us today. It was, it was really great to talk with you. It was great to kind of hear uh, a bit about the insights of Bitbond and, and talk about 
uh, some related areas. So uh, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a big pleasure um, uh, talking to you and uh, look forward to seeing you next time in Berlin. Absolutely. Well, I am in Berlin, but uh, <laughs> I'll see you soon, I'm sure. Yeah, see you soon. Now, uh, I guess one last thing. If, you know, if you're interested in trying out Bitbond, uh, you want to maybe lend some money or if you uh, want to take out a loan and the site to check out is bitbond.net. So that's bitbond.net. So, you know, I, I recommend it. I think it's a, you know, it's like a, a really uh, great site and uh, Rotko is a, uh, uh, and always a guy who does this like very carefully, who's like, um, you know, very conservative in sort of his approach to that, which is of course a good thing when it comes to lending that you don't make sort of uh, foolish, rash actions that we often see with Bitcoin startups. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks so much. So uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, it was great to have you again this week and we'll be back next week i think we're putting out uh, a second episode from coin summit uh, on thursday probably and then we'll have a regular episode again a week from now so thanks so much for listening if you want to support the show you can do so by donating and you can do that at epicenterbitcoin.com slash tips it's very much appreciated and you can also leave us an itunes review which uh, helps us a lot and helps people a lot find the show and uh, finally, you can subscribe to a newsletter, which goes out every Friday. And that's at epicenterbitcoin.com slash newsletter. I know Rodgers has been a subscriber for a long time because I put his name on it sort of when I started it. <laughs> um, so you can do that there. So thanks so much. And we'll be back next week. <laughs>